delicate, crunchy, cool, shaved or crunched ice topped with syrup or fruit juice, sometimes with the addition of condensed milk, whipped cream, or maraschino cherries. Whether you call it hollow hollow, shaved ice, Italian ice, snowballs, or snow cones, these delicious summery treats have made many childhood summers just a little bit cooler and just a little bit more special. Today, I wanna share with you guys my painting process for this illustration, where Kara, the main character from my comic, Seven Inch Kara, gets to try snowballs for the first time. I hope you guys will enjoy this tutorial. To begin, we're going to start by stretching this penciled watercolor illustration. This is a little bit of a cheat because I used my special blue line printing technique to print a digital sketch that I'd completed in Photoshop onto Canson's Moulin de Roy watercolor paper. I penciled that using a mechanical pencil and now I am stretching my watercolor paper which will remove some of that blue dye. It's going to be totally unnoticeable in the finished watercolor illustration which is why I refer to it as my disappearing blue lines magic trick. It's one of my favorite techniques and I use it all the time when I'm working on watercolor comic pages. Speaking of watercolor comic pages, if you're new here, hi, welcome. I hope to help you make art a habit. I'm Becca, I'm a watercolor comic artist and illustrator and I write draw and paint the comic Seven Inch Kara, which you guys can read for free at seveninchkara.com. And if you've read it, let me know what you think. I'd love to hear from you guys over in my Discord server, The Paint Box. So I am using Coralplast, uh, the same sort of plastic boards that people print political signs on. I'm using that as my stretcher board. So my structural support to help allow this watercolor illustration to dry nice and straight so we can actually paint on it and it's going to provide support throughout the duration of the entire watercolor illustration. I'm also using bulldog clips and binder clips as well as low tech low tack blue painters tape instead of watercolor illustration tape. I've tried watercolor illustration tape in the past and I really don't like it. I've tried a lot of masking tapes as well and the low tack blue painters tape is really the best that I've found. I'll have all of the materials that I used for this watercolor illustration down in the description below. I am working with my massive Daily Driver watercolor palette. It's got lots and lots of colors because as somebody who paints watercolor comics, I like to have a lot of convenience colors on hand, but you don't need nearly this many colors to paint a watercolor illustration that you'll enjoy. And I'm starting by toning my illustration with warm, sunny yellows because I really want to convey that sort of sunshiny summer day feeling with this illustration. I want the atmosphere to feel really hot so that you guys think about just how cool and refreshing those snowballs actually are. To really hammer home the point, I am painting in a round, almost like the sun, I'm painting in this golden round orb in the background and doing a little bit of graduated fading with a slightly more orange yellow. Now, when I'm painting, I don't like telling you guys exactly what colors I'm using for what, because this isn't a paint by numbers. I don't want you to just copy what I'm doing. I'm gonna talk to you guys about why I select the colors I'm selecting, the thought process that goes into them, so that when you're painting, you can paint with confidence. So where we have light, we must have shadow. That's the best way to just convey how bright and sunny this illustration is. So I am using an ultramarine blue to paint in the shadows cast by our snowballs here. Now, what do you guys call these where you're from? I'm from Southeast Louisiana. We refer to these as snowballs. In fact, New Orleanian even invented a special ice crushing machine. So snowballs are truly something uniquely Louisiana and very, very special. So if you're ever down here, I hope you guys will go out of your way to find one. They are a very sugary, but very delicious and refreshing summer treat. So if I could go back in time and repaint these, I would not have been quite 
it's so literal with those shadows that you guys see there they have a little bit more detail I would have painted them a little bit lighter and faded them out just a little bit more so they're not as distracting as they are but you know what y'all that's one of the plus sides to narrating in post is that I can shoulda coulda woulda I can see all the things I would do differently and it provides me the opportunity to critique my own work and think critically about how I'm going to improve as a watercolor artist and what I would do in the future. Now I am painting on a cotton rag watercolor paper today. You're going to hear me talk about cotton rag watercolor papers a lot here on the channel. When I'm painting my comic pages, I paint on a cellulose paper. I paint on Canson's Montval watercolor paper. I happen to really like it. I think it is an excellent cellulose paper, but when I'm doing illustrations and I want to do loads of color and I want to do loads of layers and I want to do lots of detail, I'm going to grab a cotton rag watercolor paper because it's going to be able to take all the water and color mixing and wet into wet and blending and layering that I'm going to throw at it in a way that I know cellulose papers just can't quite do. So I am painting my styrofoam cup. So you guys have seen styrofoam cups. You guys know most of the time they are white in color, but I don't want to just leave the white of the page. So I'm using that ultramarine blue as our base color, our starter color. And that basically when you're painting white, you want to make sure you paint the shadows on the white because it makes the white pop out more. And for me, when I have white objects that take up a lot of the page, unless they are just a striking pure neutral white, I will do an undercolor of yellow or blue or gray or something that reflects the local color that's being utilized in the illustration because white has a tendency to kind of take on the colors of its environment. And I'm going to do several layers of this ultramarine blue mix to really establish the styrofoam texture. I'm also going to do this really fine sort of dot. It's like really, really little lines. And I'll zoom in so you guys can see better what I'm doing. So I do a lot of my watercolor painting using the largest watercolor round I can confidently use in that area. And I'm working with silver black velvets mixed fiber watercolor brushes today. I happen to really like them and I really recommend them. And you guys can see I'm doing these teeny tiny little marks trying to replicate the texture of a styrofoam cup for this. So I'm not just going in and painting a flat surface. I'm really trying to capture the texture that styrofoam has because I really, really want this to feel like my childhood. My dad would take me swimming twice a week, usually on Saturday afternoons and then some weekday afternoon when he had enough energy to take me and often after taking me swimming he would take me down to Mr. Snowman's which was a local junk food kind of joint but they did snowballs and he would always buy me a snowball I could have whatever snowball I wanted and for some reason I always had spearmint as a kid and I just remember hanging out with my dad on the searing hot concrete tabletops that Mr. Snowman's had in a t-shirt and shorts and my bathing suit and enjoying a nice refreshing spearmint snowball on a blazing hot day. I can even remember the smell of the vanilla ice cream that my dad would eat while I was enjoying my snowball. So I'm really trying to capture those childhood summertime memories in this. I want it to feel really nostalgic even if Kara is only seven inches tall and not a true representation of a real human I still want to really capture the feeling of enjoying a snowball on a hot day so for me as a Louisianian our local food foods are really important they were a huge part of my childhood they're a huge part of our culture and there's something I'm very proud of and I want to share with other people and even something as simple as a snowball which lots of cultures Cultures enjoy shaved ice with some sort of syrup or fruit juice or fruit bits on top of it but that's just something that's beautiful something that we all have in common that we can all say yeah I really like that that was a big part of my childhood so I want to use illustration like this to kind of help convey that 
So I apologize for my hair blocking the shot there, but you guys can also see as I'm going in and I'm allowing past layers to dry, I'm mixing the colors darker, I'm mixing the colors more saturated. So not only am I mixing in more ultramarine, but for the furthest snowball, I've mixed in some neutral tint as though the two snowballs in front of it were casting a shadow, were blocking the light source so that we have that sense of depth, we have that sense of dimension. And even though there's not a detailed environment here, you start to feel like this could be a real moment. At least that's my goal. I have a very cartoony art style, but even when you have a very cartoony art style, it really pays to pay attention to the real world, to pay attention to how things look and try to replicate some of those things realistically, because you can kind of create this sense of heightened reality, of augmented reality. And sometimes I find that really fun for creating something that just feels super nostalgic. So that was my goal here. And I am spending so much time making sure I capture those shadows, making sure I render that styrofoam, partially because I'm just having fun with it. I'm enjoying it. I'm in the moment. I'm in the mood. And you guys know how much fun that can be when you're an artist, when you're just feeling what you're painting. So I'm blending out some of the darker areas with clean water so that we don't have just like kind of a solid monolith of shadow, but it kind of blends out as it goes around the form of the styrofoam cup. So when I'm painting and when I'm drawing, I'm always thinking volumetrically. I'm thinking about what shapes these objects have in real life. I'm not thinking about them as 2D objects I'm painting in watercolor. I'm trying to think of them as 3D objects that I'm rendering. So one of the reasons I wanted to paint snowballs was it meant I got to do a lot of really fun wet into wet techniques with some really bright colors. So you guys know I had to represent Spearmint as somebody who has drunk so many Spearmint snowballs in my childhood, had to represent that. And I also wanna make sure I represent how much that syrup leaks all over that styrofoam cup, how much it drips, how much it drops, how much, no matter how quick you eat that snowball, it's going to be all over the place. Or is that just me? Am I just like a super messy eater? So I started with a layer of hooker's green and while that was still wet, I also dabbed in some phthalo blues and some indigo blues to kind of start painting in the shadows. And then I also went in with a mix of hooker's green with some undersea green. And I'm gonna end up reworking this later on. It's another reason I really like cotton rag watercolor papers is they're forgiving. You can often go back and rework an area if it was too dark or if it was too light or if it was just the wrong color, you can kind of nudge it into what you want it to be. So for the next snow cone, I'm going with that impossibly blue raspberry, the blue raspberry that stays on your tongue and your teeth all day long and I applied a liberal layer of water first and then I went in with a really cool phthalo blue. And I'm making sure that I paint those drips, I paint those drops and I just really enjoy doing wet into wet techniques and things like candy and snowballs and baked goods because they have this like variety of saturation in their colors can make wet into wet so much fun. They're some of my favorite things to paint. So as my snowball dries, but isn't totally dry, I'm going in and dipping additional blues, darker blues, additional colors. And I am painting today using ceramic palettes Honestly, they make painting a lot easier now that I'm not traveling all the time. I really prefer to grab a ceramic palette when possible. Um, and they're so easy to clean out. You just use a paper towel with some water and you just wipe that thing out if you need to put some fresh colors in. So for Kara's snowball, I wanted to do a rainbow snowball. So usually that's three colors, red, yellow, blue is kind of the default for that. I could not even tell you guys what rainbow flavor is because it just tastes like sweet to me. It's one of those that are so sweet. And then for the final snowball, I wanted to go with my current favorite, which is strawberry with condensed milk, which is actually really good. Don't knock it till you tried it. With a maraschino, no, this one doesn't have a maraschino cherry. For some reason I thought I'd drawn a maraschino cherry. So for this, I really wanna capture that like fakey fake synthetic strawberry coloring. So we're going with a pinky kind of cool. This is cherry red from Holbein. So it's actually a quinacridone red. So when you water it down, it really has a tendency to go pink, which is exactly what I wanted for our fakey fake strawberry snowball. 
And I'm also echoing some of those colors in the snowball that Kara has with the red, the yellow, and the blue. So for the condensed milk, I made sure to reference this because even though I enjoy condensed milk in my snow cones, usually they all get so mixed up like as you're eating them that you can't really tell what's what anymore. So I wanted to reference it. And I noticed that you can definitely see some of the underlying syrup color through the condensed milk as it kind of thins down, as it kind of waters down and melts into the snowball. So I wanted to make sure that I allowed some of that fake strawberry color to kind of bleed into the area where our condensed milk is going to be. No, now I'm looking at them. There is definitely a cherry in this one. How do I forget what I've drawn? I've just been drawing a lot, so that's probably why. And then while it's still wet, I'm dipping in, this is a stronger mix of that Quinn Red, as well as some Lizarin Crimson and some Naphthamide Maroon. So I wanna start building up that color depth because if you guys have ever had shaved ice or snowball or snow cone, you guys will see, it's a little bit like rock candy where you have some areas that are really, really, really intense, deep, dark color where it almost looks like black. And then you have some really light areas as the syrup is kind of seeping into that crushed ice. And then you also have some areas that are almost white because the light is hitting that shaved or that crushed ice and kind of sparkling off of it. And that's something I wanted to convey in this illustration. And in a way, this illustration is kind of an homage to my dad because he's the one who used to take me out for snowballs like all the time. So one of the problems with this illustration is that I was just having so much fun painting it. I was having so much fun doing wet and wet and adjusting the colors and trying to create this color depth that in some instances I may have overworked it and um, you know I may have lost some of the freshness of color by having so much fun playing with these colors. So one piece of advice that I have for my fellow watercolor artists is that when you're in doubt, let it dry because often with watercolors, it dries a little lighter, not as saturated. So for our condensed milk, I've actually mixed up a little bit of sepia and some Venetian red, because if you've looked at condensed milk, it does have kind of a creamy, creamy brown undertone to it. And I wanted to make sure that I captured that with this illustration. And I'm also starting out on our cherry. And I think for the cherry, I'm actually starting with a scarlet red because I did want it to stand out, even though maraschino cherries are also super fakey fake. Um, I wanted to kind of differentiate it from the strawberry syrup on the strawberry snow cone. So after really noodling around with the snowballs and getting the colors kind of established and getting the light all established, I'm able to finally start focusing on some of the other things like the straw. So I want to make sure I capture the volumetricness, the volume of the straw. Straws are cylindrical, so it depends on where the light source is. But generally, the center of the straw, especially as it enters the drink or the object, is going to be darker than the sides of the straw, especially if the light is coming coming from behind or from above.
All right, so now that the most important part of this illustration is done, I can actually focus on everything else. Kidding, kidding, kidding. But the snowballs were the inspiration for this and they were a lot of fun to paint. So I wanted to make sure I had those in a place where I was happy before I started painting Kara herself and the rest of the illustration. So I used some clean water to wipe out my ceramic mixing palette. And I went ahead and I mixed up, you know, the de facto skin tone that I used for Kara. So it's a little bit of scarlet with a little bit of yellow ochre. There are so many different ways you can achieve different skin tones. I've got some great tutorials here on the channel where I talk about mixing skin tones and I talk about different color combinations you can use to make skin tones. And I talk about painting different ethnicities and different skin tones. So I hope you guys will check those tutorials out. But I paint Kara a lot since she is one of two main characters from my comic. So I have kind of a set way for how I paint her time and time again. And even with Kara, I really want to make sure that I'm able to convey that this is a really bright hot sunny day so I'm going to go for more saturated colors than I might normally go for because that really gives the impression of it being a sunny day now realistically if it is super hot and the Sun is super bright it can have a tendency to kind of blow out the colors especially when you first go outside but we're not talking reality here we're talking nostalgia and everybody knows that nostalgia is in technical color and way brighter than it actually happened. So as I'm painting her skin tone, I'm really reliant on using layering and glazing to build up my saturation and to build up my color. And for this to be the most successful, it means I really need to be patient and let the prior layer dry as much as possible before I apply my next layer or you're just gonna get wet into wet and the color is going to kind of diffuse. And since this is a summer illustration, I wanted to paint Kara a little bit sunburnt because I don't know about y'all, but I am covered in freckles and I get sunburnt bad every year. So you know, that freckle representation, I definitely got to paint the sunburn. So to do that, I don't want her to look like she just got totally boiled in crawfish boil. I don't want her to be totally red. So what I'm doing is I'm picking selected areas and using a bit of alizarin crimson and then kind of blending it out. So you want to think a little bit strategically with this. You want to think about areas that the sun is the most likely to hit. So that means I got to go into my memory and think about the areas on me that used to get sunburned a lot as a kid and it was my face my shoulders my neck and collarbones and definitely the tops of my thighs and calves and my upper arms so that is where I'm painting the sunburn on Kara So some of my friends here on YouTube have pointed out that they're kind of struggling with layering and glazing. So I want to disclose some secrets with you guys. This video has been time lapsed so much. So this is absolutely not a reflection of how fast I paint and I never include the dry times as I'm painting. I always pause the video and wait for my paper to dry. And that to me is one of the big keys to doing successful layering, whether you're painting on cellulose paper or cotton rag paper is give it a chance to dry if you actually want it to show up as another layer. Another thing, if you're not getting that saturation or that contrast that you want, feel free to mix it darker. Uh, shoot, I paint a lot. So I have a lot of experience, but when I had a little less experience, what I would do is I would make swatch cards of every color. And then as I was mixing up my, you know, further saturated mixes, my shadow colors, my blush colors, whatever, I would do a swipe of that on top of my skin co tone color to make sure they work together well and I would do that on the swatch before I ever applied it to the paper and I guess I should have shared that with you guys during the time I didn't think it was that important but as I talk to more people who are interested in watercolor and don't necessarily have a lot of experience I really wish I'd saved that because it's like hey here's proof there's a lot of work that goes on in between in behind the scenes and YouTube kind of reward you for making things look easier than they are so we'll often kind of cut those important parts out but if you guys head on over to natosoup.blogspot.com I man I wrote for that blog for like 10 years I've got a lot of watercolor tutorials and I think I do share some of that process over on the blog where you guys can actually see it because that's where I spent a lot of my time learning how to watercolor before I ever started on YouTube. And you guys can see, like I develop the colors slowly. I try to build the colors up because 
with watercolor, especially on faces where it would be the most noticeable. If you go too saturated, if you go too dark, sometimes it's harder to fix. It's easier to slowly build up those layers, especially while you're building up your own confidence in how to layer and how to glaze. Um, to slowly build up those layers until you get what you want. And another thing to keep in mind, and I mentioned this earlier, is watercolor does dry lighter than it goes down, which is why applying your swatch on a separate swatch card, ideally using the same paper that you're actually painting on if you can afford it, so save those scraps, but um, a and letting it dry and seeing how that looks before you commit to it on paper can be a big help. And then another tip, even if watercolor looks dry, if you put the back of your hand on the paper and it's still cool, it's still wet. So you may want to let it dry further before you attempt layering on top of it. So generally when I'm painting clothing on Kara, I go for more natural colors. I go for more muted colors. She's a Lilliputian. It's important for her to be able to hide in the grass or hide in the shadows. But y'all, she is enjoying herself some snowballs and she deserves to wear all the bright, fun summer colors. Everybody likes bright colors sometimes and she deserves to get to enjoy them. So that was my thought when I was picking the colors for this. I wanted bright, fun, summery colors that I normally don't get a chance to paint her in in the comic because she would stand out in the grass way too much. So I went with some really bright, fun, light greens for her little slide on shoes and the bow in her hair. And I'm also going for kind of a cerulean blue for her jumper. So for her jewelry, because if you guys look closely, she's got like a little ankle bracelet and a wrist bracelet and a necklace, and they all have beads on them. I wanted to go with rainbow colored beads, especially on the necklace around her neck. I wanted to introduce as many bright, fun, pretty colors as possible because it's summer and I wanted this illustration to feel really fun and joyful, like summer is a celebration. So these teeny tiny little beads are not really the best example to talk about painting glass. I've got some way better tutorials where I talk about rendering glass here on the channel. So I'll try to make sure I link those in the description for you guys. But basically you want to maintain that transparency. Now with the beads on her neck, that means painting a bit of the string that goes through the beads, painting some of that color as we render the beads themselves. And for that, usually what I'll do is I'll do a base color for the bead, local color, so yellow or green or red or whatever the base color of it, the highlight color of that bead is. Then I'll do the color of the string itself. So if it was purple, you'd get a little bit of purple in all the different beads going through the center where the thread would have looped through. Then I start painting in my darker colors. So if it's a yellow bead, I might go with orange and then maybe with a little bit of scarlet at the center, kind of depending on the color that I've used. So like I said, I do have better tutorials on painting glass here on the channel. The beads here are really tiny, so it's hard to see, and it's not really going to give a good depiction of what I'm trying to explain to you guys. So one thing I hope you guys will definitely notice as I'm painting is that I generally, other than with these, the snowballs in the background, I try not to ever paint any one thing all the way to completion before moving on to another. On the first, that's a lot of dry time. You're spending a lot of time just waiting for that to dry when you could be painting something that's not adjacent and finishing the painting a little bit sooner. Um, secondly, it allows me to kind of develop the painting all in one go. And this is particularly helpful when you're kind of newer to watercolor and you're not really sure how much you want to render some things versus how much you want to render others or what colors you want to use in the piece. So in this illustration, I had a good idea of what Kara was going to look like, what color she was going to wear. So it was fine if I kind of saved that to the end. I really wanted to establish those snowballs because I wasn't as sure how those would look. So I wanted to kind of establish those and then kind of render Kara to match that. So that's one of my tricks when you're painting, you know, a character you paint, often an original character, you're telling a story, but you know what they look like. You're very familiar with how they're going to look, but you're not necessarily a hundred percent sure what the rest of the style is going to look like. One of the things I recommend is you A, either go with what you know and then paint the rest to match that, 
or you paint what you don't know and then change your style a little bit to match the rest of it. And it kind of depends on where you are in your watercolor illustration journey, how confident you are in your art style and how much painting you've done. As I mentioned earlier in the video, I paint a watercolor comic. I have painted literally hundreds of watercolor comic pages. I have painted Kara tens of thousands of times. So I am super familiar with how she looks. And for me, it's more fun to paint the unknown first and then paint Kara and have her match that style than for me to paint Kara and then have everything else match her. But when I wasn't as confident in watercolor, when I was newer, I would go with what I knew first, have that established. And I could look at that and be like, yeah, I like how that looks and then paint the things that I wasn't as sure about. So both are totally valid. It's all about finding a working method Method that works for you and that allows you to create the art and illustrations that you're happy with. So since I spent a lot of time painting the snowballs and building up the color and building up the depth for those, I wanted to make sure I put that same attention to detail into Kara so that she kind of matches the rest of it. Because when you have a cartoony art style like I do, you can really kind of up the ante and make it more impactful and make it more meaningful if you add more detail and if everything feels like it was painted cohesively everything kind of goes together so that's what i'm doing here with the amount of shading i'm putting in and how i'm taking a lot of care into blending out the shading in some areas and how i'm really developing the color depth for certain areas but i'm also trying not to over render which is something i <laughs> I always kind of struggle with. I don't know. Maybe it's the ADHD and the hyper focusing. I get so focused on the joy of painting that I tend to paint too much on a piece when I really should really reel it back in and use a little bit of editing and a little bit of discretion not to over render everything. So at this point, I am almost finished. I'm painting in some of the finer, tighter details on Kara's face, like the eyes and the eyelashes. I apologize because my hand is going to cover that for a lot of this. I'm so sorry. That's one of the downsides of painting kind of small. But fortunately, I do move my hand frequently so you can kind of see what's going on. I do have to say that painting those smaller, finer details has taken years of practice. I've messed it up so many times and had to dab it off with a paper towel and let it dry and then try to repaint it. So it's just something that gets easier with practice. The more you do it, the easier it's gonna get. Usually for those small details, I do move to a smaller brush. So earlier I mentioned painting with the largest brush, largest brush you're comfortable with. And that does mean that as you progress to smaller details, you do move to a smaller brush. But the reason I recommend that you paint with the largest brush you're comfortable with is because in general, when you're not painting teeny tiny details, it does prevent the paper and the image from becoming kind of muddy and kind of scratchy and kind of patchy. It allows you to cover an area a lot faster. So you're not gonna get areas that dry too quick and then you get all these streaky lines. So now I'm basically finished with the watercolor part of this illustration. So I have pulled out my watercolor pencils and I've mentioned the brands I use so many times, but I don't mind. I'll tell you again. So I am working with Karen Dash Museum Aquarelle watercolor pencils. These are really, really nice. I'm also working with Derwent Inktense pencils, which are technically not watercolor pencils because they use India ink, but you know what? They're water soluble. So I'll call them watercolor pencils because Frankly, a lot of watercolor supplies use India ink and are technically not watercolor. So rather than being pedantic, we'll just call them watercolor pencils. I'm also using Karen Dash's Super Color 2 watercolor pe pencils and Albrecht Durer watercolor pencils, which are also India ink based watercolor pencils. And I'm using this to add in highlights and to add in some sparkle and some lighter colors and just try to capture the light 
hitting our snowballs and glistening off that wet melting ice. So light blues, light greens, pinks, whites, all of those I'm using to kind of introduce that. And any area where it becomes a little bit too striking, a little bit too harsh, I use some clean water and I just kind of blend that out a little bit. Once I've finished with my watercolor pencils, it is time for white gouache. If you are not familiar with gouache, gouache is an opaque watercolor. I do not like titanium white watercolor in my watercolor set. You leave that out. I will be supplying my own gouache, thank you. And typically I like to use Utrecht gouache or Windsor Newton squash. That's just my personal favorites. I'm very used to them. I like how they handle and a little bit lasts a long time. I think I've been using the same two tubes for like six years now. So they're a very inexpensive uh, investment. Now, if you're a fun art watercolor artist, you might have a problem with somebody going in and using white gouache to add highlights because theoretically in watercolor, the white should be the white of the paper, the white that you've reserved. But you know, I do illustration. I got to add teeny, 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 tiny little highlights to eyes. I got to add rim lighting to hair. And I might want to add in some white details that I did not think about at the start of the watercolor illustration. So I love me some gouache and I liberally use some gouache. And baby, if you need to use some wash, some wash, if you need to use some gouache in your wash, go ahead and use some gouache. There's nothing wrong with that. So speaking of gouache and adding white and rim lighting i'm actually using the gouache to do just that on our snowballs here so that we can get a little bit more depth we can get a little bit more dimension now not loving the gouache that i put on that blue snowball as it goes towards the green snowball i kind of think i should have just left it as it was but hindsight is 2020 20, and it's so much easier to critique our work after it's been done for three weeks and we've been looking at the scan for a while than it is to think about that when we're painting that you know when it comes to art and making art and painting you're never going to learn anything if you're not willing to make some mistakes and make some sometimes ugly art or things that you don't love. So I'm fine with it. I'm glad I'm able to learn from it. And me pointing out how I might do things differently, it's just information for the future. I'm not gonna go back and repaint this painting just for something like that. And I don't think anybody else should do that either. because I really want to capture the light hitting these objects. I really want to do some rim lighting and delineate one object from another. I'm really taking my time when adding the gouache here. I'm adding a lot of gouache because I want to add a lot of light back into the piece where the sun is sparkling off of the snowballs. Once everything has had a chance to dry 100% you don't want to do it before it's 100% dry I'm going to very carefully remove my blue tape by pulling away from the image at a 90 degree angle now sometimes you'll get a little bit of tape still stuck to the paper you can scrape that off with a nail you can use a sand eraser you can use white vinyl eraser to just kind of pick that up um, but I tear away at a 90 degree angle because if it's going to tear the paper which might happen even washi tape sometimes tears the paper. I want it to tear away from the illustration. I don't want it to tear into the illustration. And I've had the most success by tearing away carefully and gently, but confidently at a 90 degree angle. And there we have it. 
another watercolor illustration. I had so much fun painting this and I had so much fun narrating it for you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial and I hope you guys will look forward to many more watercolor tutorials to come. So in general, I do share more of my step-by-step -step watercolor tutorials over with my amazing patrons over on Patreon. So if you're interested in learning step-by-step to paint along with me, I hope you will consider joining me over on patreon.com. If you are newer to watercolor and you'd really like to learn how to paint, I've got a boatload of great step-by-step -step tutorials, not only here on YouTube in several playlists that I will link in the description below, but I also have written tutorials on the blog that I mentioned, natasoup.blogspot.com. I no longer update it because I no longer find joy in updating, but updating it, but there's a lot of great stuff over there that I think you guys will find helpful, useful, and informative, and will help you make art a habit. I believe that art should be something for everyone, whether you are brand new to art, you are a hobbyist or a professional, and I hope that this tutorial made that just a little bit easier for you guys. And a huge, massive thank you and shout out to these amazing patrons that you guys see listed here. This tutorial would not at all be possible possible without their support. So thank you guys so much.